Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the next installment of OEFC in Exile. Um, we're in Titus chapter 2, and I'm going to read the last verses from verse 9 through to the end of the chapter. Teach slaves to be subject to their masters in everything, to try to please them, not to talk back to them, and not to steal from them, but to show that they could be fully trusted, so that in every way they will make the teaching about God our Saviour attractive. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this present age, while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. These then are the things you should teach, encourage and rebuke with all authority. Do not let anyone despise you. I just read the story of some parishioners who were unhappy about the work ethic of their vicar. They complained he's bone idle. He hasn't done an honest day's work in his life. What does he do with himself all week? And then they delivered the knockout punch. He is six days invisible and one day incom incomprehensible. This week we come to the subject of the workplace in our studies in Titus. And the thought may have crossed your minds, what is a church minister to say on the subject of work? He's in his ivory tower all week, divorced from the real world. Well, I asked for some latitude this morning, therefore, but I did have a nine to five job once. Over the last two weeks, we've been thinking about the sound living Titus should be teaching that accords with sound doctrine. After con considering the sound living for the men and women in the Cretan churches, both young and old, the Apostle Paul now turns his attention to another group, the douloi, the slaves, the plural form of doulos. In verse 11, Paul writes, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. And that is the wonderful thing about the grace of God. It appears to all people, regardless of their station in life, to the well healed and to the down and outs. And the gospel had come to the lowest class of people on Crete, slaves. Their legal standing in the Roman Empire was such that even criminals had more rights. Slaves had no rights at all, in fact, enjoyed no personhood. They could not own property. They were property. To all intents and purposes, they were merely the property of a particular owner, just like any other piece of property he owned, a building, a chair or a vase. The only difference was they could speak. It has been estimated that up to 30% of the population of Rome at the time of Caesar Augustine was, were, were slaves, but the levels of slavery differed throughout the various regions of the Roman Empire. Slaves were generally men. Soldiers captured from the armies Rome had defeated often ended up as slaves and were sold in the marketplace. Their market value was determined by their age, fitness, disposition and skill set. So slaves provided most of the raw labour in the Roman Empire and were an essential part of the economy. Life understandably for a slave was not an enviable one. They could be treated brutally by their owners, discarded like a piece of refuge when too old or too sick to work, beaten, mistreated, and even killed with no rights of recourse to the law. But the fortunate ones were treated more humanely, and some were given roles of great responsibility in running the households of their masters. But generally, life for a slave was hard and grim. Obviously, simply being another person's property, having no individual identity, being bereft of all human rights is totally alienous to us in the 21st century. We're grateful there is no state-sponsored slavery in Britain today, 
although we are aware of the economic exploitation of vulnerable people that still does occur in our society. Young women from overseas have been tricked into our country, promised a job and housing, only to find themselves coerced into prostitution. Sex trafficking is heartbreaking and is a stain on our nation. But even with the precarious nature of the gig economy in Britain, in modern Britain, the vast majority of workers today enjoy rights and safeguards unheard of in the Roman Empire of the first century. So despite the vastly different cultural setting of Crete in the AD 60s and our country in 2021, what Paul has to say about Christian slaves in the workplace does have relevance for us today. Christians are not slaves, they're employees. They are Christian employees. They should conduct themselves in the workplace in a manner appropriate to sound doctrine. Paul always had a purpose in mind when it came to the sound living which should emanate from sound doctrine. The older women should develop reverence so as to be able to teach what is good to the younger women. The younger women should devote themselves to their families and to holy living so that no one would malign the word of God. Titus should embody the sound living he taught so as not to discredit either himself or Paul. The slaves, however, should conduct themselves in a, such a way to make the teaching about God our Saviour attractive. That's the second half of verse 10. So, so the onus today from this passage is for the Christian worker to make the gospel attractive in the workplace. The Christian's responsibility is to show his employer and work colleagues what Christianity is. Paul in verses 9 and 10 gives the Christian worker five principles to work by. I've arranged my headings in terms of five adverbs to paraphrase Paul. The purpose of an adverb is to add expression to the verb. Well, the verb I'm using unsurprisingly is work. Firstly then, work obediently. Verse 9, teach slaves to be subject to their masters in everything. It is the same Greek word hupotasso, translated as be subject to, as is used in verse 5 regarding wives being subject to their husbands. It is a word used by the military to denote the chain of command. Now the understandable argument is made by many that just as slavery was an, an unfortunate part of the first century culture, so too was the husband-wife relationship. A wife submitting to her husband was the accepted way of things then. It has no bearing on our more enlightened times now. There should be no male leadership principle in Christian marriage, but today instead have two partners of equal authority in the relationship. What Paul taught then in the AD 50s and 60s does not apply in the 2020s. After all, we don't have slavery today. Therefore, male leadership in a marriage, in a Christian marriage, has no legitimacy. It's a relic of the past and anachronism. That's the argument and it sounds reasonable. It seems rational. However, if we as evangelicals take the Bible in its entirety, this point of view does not hold theological water. The husband-wife relationship was forged in creation. Genesis 2 states, The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. Eve was the helper, Adam was the leader. He was responsible for both, for them both in a way Eve was not. God saw all that he had made and it was very good. Male headship in marriage was creational and not cultural. It was as God intended. A loving, sacrificial husband and a voluntarily submissive wife. In fact, Mitch mirror the picture of Christ in his relationship with the church. 
Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. So the husband's headship goes all the way back to creation and is reiterated in the New Testament by the comparison with church with Christ's headship over the church. Slavery, however, has nothing to do with creation. Slavery was not part of the creation God surveyed and concluded was very good. Slavery came about as a result of mankind's fall into sin. Men and women chose wickedness over righteousness, and slavery was one of the consequences. The weak were exploited by the poor, but the weak were exploited by the strong. The poor were taken advantage of by the rich. The defenseless came to become at the mercy of the powerful. The very effects of the fall were even spoken of in terms of slavery. Paul describes himself as one who is enslaved to his sinful nature. He has been sold as a slave to sin. He struggles to do the good he wants to. Instead, he does the evil he doesn't want to. On account of his sinful nature, he is a slave to the law of sin. So unlike the male-female dynamic of marriage, slavery was never a part of God's intention for humanity. It was a byproduct of man's rebellion against God's righteous law. Let's get back, however, to the text. If anyone had a justification to be disobedient, it was a slave in the first century. Downtrodden, oppressed and exploited, surely a slave had a right, we might think, to tell his master where to go and where to get off when he started issuing his orders. But Paul's overriding concern was not social, but spiritual. It wasn't cultural, but Paul was consumed with the good name of Christ as saviour. He wanted even browbeaten slaves to show off the glory of the gospel and its potency to change lives. The grace of God was sufficient for a slave to work obediently. If a slave was to work obediently then, what of the Christian employee in the workplace today? Well, he or she is to work according to the company rules. If the start time is 8.30 in the morning, he or she isn't to be late. If the contracted time to work to is 4.30 in the afternoon, he is to adhere to it. He is to acknowledge his boss's authority. After all, everyone has a boss, and no Christian is above following instructions. Obviously, when Paul writes, slaves are to be subject to their masters in everything, there has to be a qualification. A boss's instruction to falsify or to lie on behalf of the company has to be declined. A Christian employee I knew in a food business was responsible for the quality control of certain of the product lines. He was under pressure, though, from the management to ratify that the quality thresholds of the products had been met even when they hadn't. It meant forwarding an inaccurate report to the company's customers. He refused. He said he couldn't do it. And when this conflict persisted, he informed the management he would have to leave and find a new job, which he did after a couple of months. But if the boss is quite within his right to ask you to do a task, you should do it. And you should do the work you are paid to do. Work obediently, says Paul. Secondly, work conscientiously. Try to please them, writes Paul. I came across this comic verse. I don't mind the work if I've got nothing else to do. I quite admit it's true that now and then I shirk particularly boring kinds of work. Don't you? Slaves in the Roman Empire had generally hard and menial work to perform the sort of work their masters thought below them to do. The temptation to shirk, like the verse says, must have been enormous, to do the bare minimum, just enough to get by without being scolded. It may have been the case that some of the slaves whom Titus was to teach had Christian masters. The gospel had penetrated these households and had reached both free man and slave, those relaxing upstairs and those grafting downstairs. The Christian slave then had the additional temptation to ease off 
not to work conscientiously, but to trade on the faith he shared with his master. He would be a special case in the eyes of his master. He would not have to work as hard as both he and his master were members of the one true church. Paul addressed this potential problem in his first letter to Timothy. Those who have believing masters should not show them disrespect just because they're fellow believers. Instead, they should serve them even better because their masters are dear to them as fellow believers. What view do we take of our work? Is it a means to an end to earn money? Is it a necessary evil? Do we just do the bare minimum? Is it something we enjoy? Actually, a lot of people are obsessive workers. Work is what I do. Man is a compulsive worker as a hen is a compulsive layer of eggs, as someone has written. But the context of Titus indicates strongly that the slave's work was humdrum and tedious and the enthusiasm levels were low. Yet Titus is to urge them to be proactive, to look out for the interests of their masters and to give thought as to how they work more efficiently. In every job there are elements of tedium. But as someone once said to me when I first entered the world of work, a job is what you make of it. If we take pride in doing it well, a genuine sense of fulfilment is a result. John Stott writes, an important part of our self-fulfillment as human beings is to be found according to God's purpose in our work. He then goes on to quote Genesis chapter 1 and verse 28. Be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. In other words, reproduce, populate and work. Some of the most unglamorous work is the most vital. In Bromley, unlike in Seven Oaks, our bins are only collected every two weeks. When the weather gets warm, like it is this weekend, rubbish, of course, gets smelly very quickly. How grateful we are to our bin men when they take away our rubbish every second week. Not a pleasant job, but so important to maintain public health and hygiene. I read an interview recently with a lady who drives a refuge collector vehicle for the Bolton Waste and Recycling Depot. She said she had a high level of job satisfaction. She liked working in a team, building up a relationship and gaining the respect of the residents on her route and knowing she was doing a job so useful to the public. That is the key, isn't it? Knowing that our work is not only beneficial, but also appreciated adds considerably to our sense of job satisfaction. But the Christian employee has the additional motivation to be conscientious. These are the words Paul writes to the slaves at Colossae. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Work obediently, work conscientiously, and thirdly, work respectfully. Not to talk back to them, writes Paul. I imagine it was easy for a slave on Crete as elsewhere in the Roman Empire to become embittered. Perhaps his master was a harsh one. Perhaps often he felt his master's rod on his back. Perhaps he was given just the barest of provisions for subsistence. Stripped of dignity and callously treated, he was sour. When his master told him to get on with the task, it would be natural to mutter and curse his master under his breath and to wish him a long walk off a sheep, short pier. But Paul was telling Christian slaves such behaviour, despite their lowly station in life, was not acceptable for the redeemed people of God. Let's be honest, that was a tough call. If anyone was entitled to have a moan in the workplace, it would be a slave in the Roman Empire. But Paul ruled it out. Moaning, complaining and talking back to their masters would not be the sound living in accordance with sound doctrine. It would not make the gospel attractive in that particular household. Argumentative Christian slaves would be just like any other slaves. Instead, they were to work respectfully. 
I saw this headline in the newspaper recently. Workers spend three hours a week complaining about their job and another 31 minutes moaning about their boss. Is that right? It seems an awful amount of time. It seems a tremendous loss in productivity. What are the things people typically moan about in the workplace? Well, usually quite trivial issues. This time of year, air conditioning wars. It's on too little or on too much, or there's a lack of it altogether. The coffee machine isn't working. There are too few parking spaces in the car park. The endless cutbacks. A memo came round and all employees are now required to empty their own bins because the contract cleaners have been allotted fewer hours. The perks of the job are not what they once were. And then, of course, is the favourite target for a mum, the management. Too much work and too little recognition are the normal gripes. You are the Cinderella of the organisation, while less deserving colleagues are going to the ball. Of course, no employer or boss is perfect, but it is often the case that the loudest moaners are the ones who have been longest in the business. But if the working conditions are that bad, why have they stayed so long then? Surely they cannot be so intolerable, otherwise they would have moved on years ago. Don't be a workplace moaner, these verses say to the 2021 Christian employee. Don't whine, don't whinge. Don't get on the bandwagon when colleagues are running down the management or the business. It is not contact that will make the gospel attractive in the workplace. Instead, work respectfully and consider some of the difficult issues your bosses are facing in the like of the pandemic. Work obediently, work conscientiously, work respectfully and fourthly, work honestly. And not to steal from them, writes Paul. Again, if anyone had justification for theft, it was a slave on Crete from his master. He owned nothing. He was a piece of property. He earned nothing. He was entitled to nothing. After a hard day of labouring for his master, a slave must have felt the justification of helping himself to some of the household's valuables. It was probably the crime of theft that caused Onesimus, the slave of Philemon, to flee from Colossae to Rome, where he stumbled into the imprisoned apostle Paul and was gloriously converted. So slaves thieving from their masters would be commonplace on Crete. But Paul, despite the impoverished condition of a slave, forbade Christian slaves from stealing. It was conduct unbecoming of a Christian. It would bring the gospel into disrepute. Pilfering his master servant silver was not an option for a slave professing faith in Jesus Christ as his saviour and lord. What causes employees to steal from their employers today? Well, perhaps a sense of grievance. You've been overlooked for promotion. Perhaps your job is at risk. Why not take what you can now before you're made redundant? Perhaps you and your manager are not getting on. There's a daily tension between you. You don't feel tr fairly treated. Little acts of dishonesty are what the company deserves for making the person, that person, your boss. Perhaps it is pure opportunism. The stock control procedures are lax, lax. The internal security is practically non-existent and the opportunity presents itself. No one will ever know when a memory stick goes missing. Perhaps it's the oldest chess book, chestnut in the book. Everybody does it. Why not me? Otherwise I will miss out. Christian thief is a contradiction in terms. It's like someone describing himself as a meat-loving vegetarian or as a poor billionaire. It's a contradictory statement. Work obediently, work conscientiously, work respectfully, work honestly, and lastly, work dependably. But to show that they can be fully trusted. What did the dependable slave look like? Well, he was obedient, conscientious, respectful, honest, 
And as a result, he gained the confidence of his master that he was dependable. He was Mr. Dependable. He could be relied upon to get on with the job in hand. What an incredible standard Paul was setting for a Christian slave. Unpaid, unrewarded, unrecompensed. Yet Paul's vision for Christian slaves was that they should gain a reputation for absolute trustworthiness. Why? It would make the teaching about God our Saviour attractive. You might not be among the most able in the workplace. There might be more naturally gifted colleagues. In certain areas at work, their star may shine brighter than yours. But if your boss knows you are reliable, if your manager knows he can give you a job, and if he knows he can confidently leave you to get on with it in the time frame specified, that is not only valuable to the business, it's a very practical demonstration of Christianity. It honours the name of Christ for whom you are an ambassador. It makes the gospel attractive in the workplace. A reputation for dependability is priceless. A reputation for unreliability, on the other hand, is hard to erase. We recently have had some difficulties with the company installing broadband in the church. There have been four appointments but not one stroke of practical work has been completed yet. The end result? Well, when the internet supplier specifies a new date to get the work done, it has to be taken with a large dose of salt. The Christian employee isn't to be like that. He or she doesn't overpromise. He or she delivers what they have said they will do. Work dependably. So despite the 2,000 years since the Apostle Paul wrote these few instructions to his associate Titus, they still remain five principles for Christian employees to work by. Work obediently, conscientiously, respectfully, honestly and dependably. Of course, many of the flock at Oxford are now retired. These principles then can be applied to the work you do in the church or in the community. When 40 years ago I was at college, I had a lecturer who introduced me to the writings of E.F. Schumacher, the statistician and economist and the author of the seminal book, Small is Beautiful, a study of economics as if people mattered. After he died in 1977, a collection of his writings was published posthumously under the title good work. In it he gave three purposes for human work and endeavour. Firstly to provide necessary and useful goods and services. Secondly to enable everyone to exercise and enhance their natural gifts. And thirdly to liberate the worker through cooperation with others from the innate selfishness within. These are all good and reasonable. But the Christian employee has an added purpose, namely to make the teaching about God our Saviour attractive, in, to make the gospel attractive in the workplace. Amen.